It is the 21st of January. It's a Thursday. Um, I'm on my daily exercise and the sun is shining. Uh, it's also very windy as you may be able to tell and it's the day after Storm Christoph has finally left us. I'm going to use my daily exercise today to talk to you a bit about different types of floodplain and uh, why different types of floodplain behave differently to others. Today I'm here on a quick response floodplain which is quite literally a floodplain where everything happens very quickly. And the reason for that is because it's powered by, on the grand scheme of things, quite a small river. The reason that floodplains next to smaller rivers are uh, quite quickly responding is because smaller rivers are themselves earlier on in the water cycle. If you imagine the rain falls and before it reaches the bigger rivers, it has to reach the smaller rivers. Bigger rivers, on the other hand, have slow response floodplains. So they flood quite slowly and the flood water drains away quite slowly. This is one. This was a field next to the River Severn. It's now part of the River Severn. And the River Severn is rising. Um, and although this is a slow response floodplain, it is still the 21st of January and the flood water here has come up overnight. And the reason for that is because obviously Storm Christoph started raining uh, a lot earlier on uh, up north than it did down here. So this water is most likely flood water from the Welsh mountains that actually fell uh, maybe three days ago at the very start of Storm Christoph. It's only just getting down here now. It's important to note as well that the bigger the river, the larger the floodplain tends to be. And I mean, the River Severn has only just started flooding. It hasn't even broken the levee on this side of the bank yet. But you can see just how widespread the flooding already is, certainly on the other side of the bank. I mean, it's a bit like a sea in some places out there. Now, although the big rivers do always tend to flood quite slowly, there are some instances where they can flood very fast. Behind me here is, or was, the Lower Load Car Park here in Tewkesbury. And I once stood here with a friend back in September 2019 and watched as the river burst its banks before our eyes. And it flowed into the car park, and I even got it on camera. And it was one of the most bizarre things I think I'd ever really experienced. And the reason for that wasn't anything to do with rain. It was actually caused by the moon. And by that, I of course mean the moon's constant gravitational influence on our oceans, which we know of as the tide. The flash flooding that we saw that night was actually a tidal surge making its way up the river in the wrong direction. And around half an hour before we saw that tidal surge, we were stood on a bridge about 15 kilometres downstream where we saw a tidal bore, which is essentially a tidal wave dramatically roaring up the river. completely changed direction. Right? Yeah, that's nuts. Water's flowing around the edge. As you can see, it was pretty dark and we didn't really see much. Uh, and the wave was also flattened by the large amount of water um, flowing the, in the correct direction down the river. So it was more of a very sudden surge than a wave. Given the right conditions, however, the seven bore looks like this. And living near the Severn myself, I've always been fascinated by how the seemingly gentle, slow tide can create such a sudden, roaring wave. To understand how these seven bore forms, you first need an understanding of how the tides form. Picture this. You have a sea on your planet, and you introduce a moon. The gravitational pull of that moon on the surface of the sea creates a bulge. Then, as your planet rotates on its axis, the land moves into and out of the bulge. And yes, you heard correctly. From the moon and the tides perspective, it's actually the land that's moving and not the sea. 
In reality, the tides are much more complex than this. There's actually another tidal bulge that forms on the opposite side of the Earth to the Moon, and the tides are affected by other forces, like the Coriolis effect, for example. To understand how this tidal bulge becomes a bore, we first need to look at where the bores form. Tidal bores form in large river estuaries or narrow bays, where the common factor is a restriction to movement of the tide and a narrowing channel width as it enters said river or bay. Now imagine your planet, but now from the land's perspective. Add in a moon and create a tidal bulge. Now watch as the tidal bulge enters the river mouth from the bottom right. The leading edge of the tidal bulge is slowed by the water flowing out to sea and the gradually inclining riverbed. This means that the water in the rest of the tidal bulge catches up with the leading edge before the leading edge has been able to move up the river. As you can see, this decreases the time between low and high tide from a matter of hours to a matter of seconds. This is the main principle that forms a tidal bore. The other principle is how when you squeeze a body of water, the water level increases to compensate. So as the water is pushed up the channel, the height increases. As the seven bore climbs further inland, the ever decreasing width of the river channel and the constant slowing of the leading edge by the building mass of water ahead of it cause the wave to rise to heights of almost three meters. Eventually, it collides with the weir in Maysmore, and the tidal wave is reduced to a mere tidal surge for the rest of its journey upstream. In the wake of the bore, the river flows very quickly in the wrong direction, and smaller waves, known as whelps, tend to follow. So hopefully you now understand all the ins and outs of how tidal bores form, and I'll leave you with some footage of that night in Tewkesbury, while we watch the river burst its banks before our very eyes. The rate at which this is moving is unbelievable. Look at that! Look at that! Look at it flowing here, Will. Oh my god! The speed! It's going down now, but it's dead now. And if you look where we are, it's gone. And just like that, whilst I've been stood here just for a matter of seconds. I'm starting to become submerged in water, and Oscar stood there. Make sure you can get out, please. Yeah, we will be able to. That's unbelievable, mate. Look at it. It's just well, it's flowing quick. around this gate. It wasn't here before. Can you get it on my feet? Can you sort of see my feet now? I'm at least an inch in water already. It's sort of like a slow, like a sped up view of how it flies. Look how fast it's moving here. Do you want to get out of there before you... Yeah, I think I better have. My God! Dude! That was dry as anything before, wasn't it? You're in the River Severn. But you were in a car park. Look at that bit of grass there, it's gone. Whoa! Was that Look deep? That. That'll be about... Right, I'm not going to try and get too far in it because I'm going to get wet feet, but... That's about a foot deep, probably. This is a tide, bro. The moon is sucking this water up onto the, into Tewkesbury. So you've just found this bubbly bit of water, and it's... Oh, mate, there's a lot of air coming up from that. Oh, it's coming from. It's like... It doesn't really go anywhere. Oh, God, I'm getting caught. Okay, he's reached the other side of his driveway now. Here we go.